Hi, my name is Taylor and I'm going to be presenting on modeling antibodies using Rosetta Antibody. These slides are adapted from Nina's slides from our previous year, so I thought that I should at least mention that. When we model antibodies, we choose to exclusively model the fragment variable region. This is because the loops that comprise the periotope are within the fragment variable region and also because the elbow region that separates the constant and the variable portions of the fab is highly flexible, which makes it so that if we need to take RMSD calculations on a loop, um, we're going to be superimposing using a set of residues that are in the fragment variable region and we're also going to be taking our measurements in the same region. Um, and then also if we're doing some sort of binding or affinity maturation protocol, um, then or some sort of docking or affinity maturation protocol, uh, the, we're going to also uh, just be working with the fragment variable region. Uh, so there, there tends not to be much of a purpose to model the entire fab. So in Rosetta Antibody and in many other uh, antibody modeling suites, uh, you will, you'll find that the, the general trend is that uh, pretty much everyone is going to choose to model a, a heavy and a light fragment uh, separately, and then they're going to do some uh, kind of, some sort of docking to try to recover kind of the interaction between the two chains. Um, and so each of the two fragments has a very highly conserved fold. This fold is conserved across uh, pretty much all jawed vertebrates. Uh, I, I think it may be all jawed vertebrates. It's definitely the majority. Um, so you have a series of alternating framework and uh, complementarity determining regions. So the framework regions are responsible for presenting the set of loops um, that actually determine the complementarity. Uh, and so frameworks are pretty much all going to be little hairpins um, and then the complementarity determining region uh, is a set of loops that forms spatial complementarity with whatever antigen is being bound. Uh, and this this peritope is uh, typically pretty hydrophobic, and it has a strong net negative charge in most cases. Um, but yeah, so this is this is the fold that's uh, observed in in fragment variable regions. Um, and the fact that it's very highly conserved makes it so that uh, it's kind of an ideal candidate for a comparative modeling based approach um, within uh, most software suites that model it. So it's going to involve a template search where you, you search for uh, experimentally, uh, yeah, experiment, search through experimental data for uh, relatively close sequence matches to uh, whatever you're trying to model. And then you're going to have another portion where you um, sample uh, VH and VL orientations in order to uh, try to, and you're going to use an energy function in order to try to figure out uh, kind of how uh, the VH and the VL would, would dock together in that kind of particular case. Uh, and then you're going to have sampling regarding canonical loop confirmations in which um, each of the CDRs that's germline encoded uh, is going to have uh, a relatively small set of loops rel relative to sequence space. Uh, is going to have a set of loops that uh, can be predicted from kind of experimentally observed uh, clusters that have already been found. Uh, and then you're going to have the CDRH3, which needs to be modeled separately because um, to date there haven't really been any successful attempts to, to cluster it uh, into a kind of a, into a relatively small set of clusters. Um, so, yeah. So you, you probably saw this slide in Rocco's presentation, but it basically just showed that uh, sequence variability for each position in the sequence was much higher for uh, the CDRs than in, within the framework regions. Um, and so uh, fortunately in structure space, these loops are more, somewhat more conserved than they are in sequence space. Um, so there was a paper in 2011 called North et al. 2011, um, in which North um, demonstrated that they were able to uh, model all of, um, or were able to cluster all of the CDRs that were in the PDB into a significantly smaller set of clusters than uh, the total number of structures. Um, and so so they were able to do this for uh, every loop except for the CDRH3, which has greater uh, kind of genetic diversity and it has, um, uh, it's also chewed back, uh, the genes are chewed back in a way that, that even the, the light chain CDR3 is not. Um, so just through from the recombination process, there are um, uh, yeah greater diversities introduced to it, um, 
and so so that's the one loop that can't really be successfully modeled using uh, or couldn't be clustered successfully using North Dunbrack's uh, the North Dunbrack clustering scheme and um, it also could not be um, yeah it, it's typically modeled separately um, so another thing that's sampled kind of using experimental data is this VL and VH orientation um, so okay yeah um, our VH and VL orientations. So um, here's a, a paper that's probably worth reading. It's uh, Mars et al. 2016. Um, and so in this, they kind of came up with a way of describing um, a set of angles that 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 uh, demonstrates kind of the interaction between a heavy and a light chain in such a way that you can you can sample each of these four angles in order to uh, yeah in order to kind of attempt a number of experimentally observed uh, yeah, uh, interactions between the two chains. And so they start by defining a point in the heavy chain and a point in the light chain. That's just the central point uh, in a set of, I think it's six residues. Let's see here. Yeah, uh, six residues in the light chain and six residues in the heavy chain. Uh, the midpoint between those, um, they draw two points and the distance between those points is called the inner domain distance. Um, and then they draw two more points that are basically the, the first principal component, principal component uh, when you, for each of the six points. Um, so you, you just travel in that direction for a certain, a certain distance. Um, and so, so the, the angle between uh, that kind of axis that makes up your inner domain, dis that your inner domain distance is measured along uh, and the angle between that and the and point two makes up your uh, opening angle for each of the chains, um, and then kind of rotation around uh, the axis defined for the inner domain distance um, is called the packing angle. And so each of these four uh, values is kind of sampled uh, throughout the throughout a, a run in Rosetta antibody, um, and. So the end result of this sampling is a, a model that has a VH and a VL that are docked as they would be, uh, yeah, in an experimentally derived structure. Um, and so kind of piecing together the various things that we've talked about so far, uh, we're going to use this figure from the Rosetta antibody paper. Um, and it basically just shows that they're doing two separate uh, search, uh, structure searches for framework templates they can use and then they do the uh, the orientation determination uh, and then they show uh, that you're grafting uh, the canonical CDRs uh, using experimental data and then they generate homology models uh, and then they do uh, a portion where they remodel the CDR or H3 um, and then they do some general refinement stuff. Um, and so one, one other thing that we should talk about is the CDR H3 uh, kind of loop classes. So there are two different types of CDRH3 that you can have. Uh, one of them is called kinked, and then one of them is called extended, or kinked or bulged, and then extended or non-kinked. Um, and so basically what this is is the last residue of the head um, is going to have an extreme angle. And so uh, you separate CDRH3s into a residues that make up the head and residues that make up the torso. So the torso region is the first three and the last four residues of the of the loop, and then the head is just whatever falls between that. Um, and so, um, if you have an extreme angle and the last residue of the of the head, uh, it's classified as kinked, and if not, it's classified as extended. Um, and so, kinked loops are more common than extended loops, uh, but uh, in in CDRH3s, but in pretty much any other protein, uh, it's going to be very rare to see a loop that's kinked in the way that a CDRH3 is. So if you if you were to use a traditional loop building algorithm, you just would not uh, be able to successfully recreate a lot of these a lot of these loops. And so, um, in order to get around this, or in order to kind of solve this issue, uh, there was another paper in which they introduced uh, kink constraints. Which basically bias uh, the loop building algorithm to recover kinked confirmations, um, and so 
uh, this contour plot here that kind of describes it pretty well. And they basically, there are two angles that they talk about. There's tau 101 and alpha 101. And so tau 101 is the pseudo bond angle of the last, uh, I think, of the last three residues. Um, and alpha is the pseudo dihedral angle of the last four residues uh, in the CR3. Um, and so in this contour plot here, they basically have a set of bounds. And um, each time you cross one of these, these contours, uh, an additional two energy unit, uh, two, two reset energy unit penalty will be applied to the model. So it kind of makes it so that uh, the farther and farther it gets away from being kinked, um, the, the larger the penalty that's applied to the model will be. So this, this orange box is everything that they would consider kinked. And these kind of shadowy boxes are um, everything that they would consider kind of ambiguous. Um, but yeah, as, as you move away from, from the center of, of this, you, you incur a larger and larger penalty. And so this makes it so that you're more likely to recover kinked uh, confirmations than you would be otherwise. Uh, and then there was this other paper kind of examining how successful Rosetta antibody was with, with the addition of this of these kink constraints uh, of, of generating structures. And they did find that there was there was a difference in the opening angles that was observed. You see uh, kind of in the gray stuff back here is uh, is experimental structures. Um, and then this outline is, um, yeah, is uh, like in silico model structures. So this is a paper that's worth reading if you're going to be, um, yeah, modeling antibodies uh, extensively. But yeah, that's worth mentioning. Uh, and we should also mention that th there's a web service called Rosie, which is provided by the Gray Lab, which basically um, does everything that we're going to show you in the tutorial. Uh, but with limited customization, and it's also a free resource. So um, people are kind of, everyone's kind of competing to use it. Um, so if, and it's also probably best if you're, if you're running a thousand structures, some ridiculous number. Uh, yeah, you should find your own computing resources instead of using theirs. So now I guess uh, that's pretty much everything we had to say. Uh, here's some literature you can read, um, the different sources that we um, had, and uh, we're, now I guess we're just going to hop over to the uh, walker.